Well, good evening. And actually, today, the applause is to all of you. Thank you very much for coming. You are really what makes Tucson an amazing place and what makes us do these things. I also want to thank, before anybody else claps here, there are a bunch of high school students up here in the corner that come because they like it, not because it's for their grade. Good for you. <laughs> So anyway, uh, when we create these lectures, we, um, the, the instructions that we all have in our head is that if everybody comes to all the lectures, uh, everybody will have more or less a sense of where the discipline is at the moment, even if it's 50,000 feet or whatever. So uh, this one would be very easy. We know very little. I think you've gotten that. But, but let me just summarize, I think, the important points that have been made. Of course, in the first lecture, it was clearly defined that we don't quite understand. Well, we, we, it's hard to define life, but we do understand some of the biomarkers of life. That's quite important. We know that we have an atmosphere that has certain, comp certain elements, certain molecules, methane, water, and oxygen. If it wasn't because of life, that combination would probably not be there after some time. So we know some of the biomarkers, as long as life is like in the Earth, anywhere else, we can start looking at their atmospheres and try to find out. We also learned that either some of the elements required for life were implanted to the Earth after the Earth was formed, and there's even the chance that you could implant bugs, living stuff, from other planets onto the Earth based on some of the experiments that have been done. That's sort of quite interesting. We also learned that the Earth was quite a boring place, even though life came out on the Earth really early on, the earliest rocks we have, 3.8 billion years, uh, show life. It was sort of boring, and there were these explosions of diversity that happened only about 500 million years ago. So you have to remember that, because if we're looking at other planets, depending where you are in the history of that planet, it may be in the boring stage, or we may have find, find somebody to talk to if it's after the, the diversity starts kicking up. The other important two points that were made was one, that uh, those reactions that sort of crank away with metabolism are probably the ones that were there all the time, and those were the core with which life sort of emerged. And finally, the one about uh, the, the, the last lecture, the one that spoke about complexity, almost suggest that life as we know it is inevitable. That you start with very small, uncomplex processes that end up, because of feedback mechanisms, creating very complex life. That's where we are today. And then, of course, uh, the bow tie guy, last time, he showed us that if we've been looking everywhere and we haven't found a thing. But we have actually discovered a lot of stuff. We've discovered water in many planets. We've discovered that there's methane in Mars, which we sort of don't know what to do with. So there's all kinds of interesting things that we can actually be doing still in our solar system. I want to take this opportunity to uh, remind us all that it's thanks to the underwriters of, of this lecture series that we're all here braving the winter of Tucson. <laughs> so we should thank them for their support. And since you're the hardcore members, obviously, just to remind you that there's going to be a panel discussion on the radio, which you can all listen to on the 20th of this month, and that you can send in your questions to the address shown there, where? Yeah, uasi at email.arizona.edu. And finally, if you think this is fun, we want to create something that's even more fun for you. I've, this, I've been describing the, bias, uh, the Biosphere Institute, which will be happening in October. We don't have the dates quite yet, but I'll give you a flavor of what it's going to be about. It's going to be three days and two nights. You'll be with a scientist. The mornings will have, of the three days, you'll be able to have conversations and discussion with scientists. There will be a component which our partner Miraval will give us on, on uh, mindful living. 
In the evenings, we will have telescopes and we have a fire pit so you can bring your marshmallows. It should be a lot of fun. Um, and we'll also do some citizen science inside of the biosphere by doing the genome of the ocean in there. So you'll be able to do hands-on experience as well as everything else. And then, those are three days at the biosphere. And for those that want to clean up, you'll be able to go to Miraval for two extra days at a reduced price. So that's the Biosphere Institute. I hope I see many of you there. There'll be two modules that we'll be giving out in October. One module will be uh, uh, the one on, uh, that goes with this lecture series on uh, life in the universe. But there'll be another module that'll be on mind and brain. So there'll be two different things that you can choose from. I hope to see a lot of you there. Now let me tell you about today's speaker, Laird Close. He's a uh, faculty member that got his degree here at the U of A, why not, we're the best. Um, and uh, he's one of these remarkable individuals that is really, really hard-headed, focused, and that we need more of, of them around. He, he, he has an NSF career uh, award, which is a very distinguished award from NSF, he got it in 2004. He's gotten awards at the U of A for his teaching and his research. But what he's done is he, he took a chance of creating instruments and telescopes capable of addressing the questions of the day, recognizing that, the, and you'll see today, that the te technology is incredibly hard. So he's, he put his whole career up front saying this is going to work because, you know, in the, U of, in the universities, in, in the first six years, you don't get a good CV, you get fired. Well, he hung in here, and we're very lucky to have Laird Close. Please welcome Laird Close. Thanks, Sophia. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Joaquin. <laughs> I am a little hard-headed, especially when I have my hard hat on, <laughs> as you saw in those photos. For safety, safety first. Anyways. I was so excited to see how many of you came to this lecture tonight. That was really exciting to me. When I woke up this morning and looked out, I was like, uh-oh, it looks kind of rainy. And I'm like, well, who's going to come tonight? And luckily, you know, my wife said, oh, lots of people will come. And I'm like, well, I don't know. You have to be crazy to come on a night like tonight. <laughs> and I'm like, thank you, you beautiful, crazy people. Thank you, you science lovers. That's great. This is what makes Tucson a great city. So look, I'm, I'm so thrilled that you guys came out. And this talk is kind of exciting for me because it re really is the sort of thing that I actually study. It's, it's my profession. It's what I do. So it's, it's nice just to be able to share it with you. So hopefully we'll have a, have a good time here. So to make the talk go along quicker, I'm going to pick up the clicker. And that'll help. <laughs> All right. And uh, so uh, let's start the lecture. All right, so what we're going to do tonight, we're going to, it's hopefully going to be a really fun lecture. We're going to tour what we know now uh, from the NASA's Kepler spacecraft about planets around other stars. So I'm going to call these exoplanets. So these are planets that are around stars other than the sun. Last week, we had a great lecture from Tim Swindle, who told us all about the search for liquid water in our own solar system. Um, how many people here feel like they detected liquid water today on Earth? <laughs> I'm there. Boy, did I ever get wet walking over here. So again, thanks guys for coming out, even though the weather was so bad. So yeah, we have liquid water here on Earth. But we don't really know of liquid water on the surfaces of any other world in our solar system. Sure, it might be under the ice in Europa, but really to have oceans, the only place that has liquid water oceans on the surface in our solar system is the Earth. So I'm going to tell you about tonight, about our exciting search for worlds around other stars that might have liquid water oceans. And in particular, I'm going to tell you about one world exactly the size of the Earth that is in the right zone, the habitable zone around its star that might have liquid water. The other thing that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about how many such worlds might exist in our galaxy. And then we're going to finish off talking about the possibility of other Let's see this. It's a little bit slow here. Hello, come on. There we go. <laughs> and we'll see how technologies developed here at the University of Arizona have helped us understand and address these questions. 
All right, so we'll move on. Now, the most important thing that I want to start with is, come on, clicker, there we go, is how uh, we can actually detect uh, planets around other stars. And so there's this simple movie here. What we use is a technique called the transit method. And by that, what happens if we have a special alignment between the star and the planet from our point of view, when the planet passes in front of the star, you see it dip right there. A little, a little dip occurs. And that's a really easy way to detect planets around other stars. This is called the transit method, and it's how the NASA Kepler mission does this. This depth of that dip tells us how big the planet is. In fact, if you think about it, the dip is simply just the ratio of the area of the star to the area of the planet. So the deeper the dip, the bigger the planet. And this way, we can measure the radius of the planet. And that's a very important feature. Now, at the University of Arizona, we do great things, and our undergraduates do amazing things. And this is one of my undergraduates, Jason Dittman who went up to the 61-inch telescope on Mount Lemmon that the university owns, and he was able to record one of these dips. And this was actually to confirm one of the smallest planets known at the time. And that's Jason. He's now actually a graduate student at Harvard, and he's working on his PhD. And you can see here's an example of that planet transit. And you can see that it's gotten just a little bit. You know, the star went along here, dipped when the planet went in front of it, and then went back up again. And that allowed us to confirm that it was a real object. Now, that was great, but it was only uh, sensitive enough because we were on the ground and we were looking through the Earth's atmosphere, so we were only sensitive enough to planets that are about five times the radius of the Earth. So that's exciting, but what we really want to do is we want to find planets that have exactly the radius of the Earth, or maybe even smaller, rocky planets, not Neptune-sized planets like what Jason was able to find. So here we have a movie showing how Kepler does it. This is how we can find planets that are exactly the same radius as our own world in outer space. This is the Kepler Space Telescope, and it's in outer space. And in outer space, there is no atmosphere, so everything is super still. And all Kepler does is stare all the time at this constellation in the northern summer sky. And what it's looking for is it's looking for those very faint, telltale dimmings of the star when planets cross uh, across the face of the star. And so it has a very big digital camera, the spacecraft. And it stares all the time with its 95 million pixels. It stares at this patch of sky. And what it's doing is it's looking for seeing if there's any signs of these dips coming back and forth. <laughs> anyway, so it's, it, what, it, what Kepler does, which is really impressive, is it images 157,000 stars. And it images all of those stars every 30 minutes. And it's been doing this for four years. Imagine that mission. So that's all it does for four years is every 30 minutes, take a picture of all these stars and check if they've dimmed. No, if they haven't dimmed, well, then there's no planet. And it did that for four continuous years. The mission's now, it's very stable. Most part of the mission's now over. And so it's on to the next thing. But what we can do here, this movie shows us a zoom in to one of the pixels on this giant digital camera. And you can see what's really interesting is on this pixel in particular, there was a star system. Uh, it's called Kepler 11 is what we've now named it. And it's fascinating because it actually had six planets all around that same star, all transiting in front of the face of the star. And that's a remarkable kind of alignment. It was a new type of solar system that we had not known about before. Another thing that Kepler told us is that planets around binary stars, these are double stars, are also fairly common. Here's an example of a movie of what Kepler 47 would look like. Of course, these are artist illustrations. We don't really know what the planets look like, but these are illustrations to sort of you know, guide the imagination, so to speak. So this is an amazing system where there's two planets in orbit around these two stars. This is a little bit like in the daytime, what Luke Skywalker would have seen when he got up in you know, the morning in Tatooine and looked out the window and saw, oh, yes, there's my two stars. So if you remember in Star Wars, Tatooine has two stars. That's critical Star Wars lore. <laughs> so in fact, astronomers, because we all love Star Wars, we call these Tatooine planets, because that's kind of like what they would be like. This is, um, this is kind of like what you could have imagined before Kepler and then during the Kepler mission. So what I'm going to start off here, these are the planets we knew before Kepler that transited their stars. And then when Kepler started pouring in all of its exciting results, we suddenly had this flood of new detections. And you can see that in these, those yellow dots at the end there. But now I'm going to zoom ahead to the present time at the end of the mission. And this shows you how many objects that Kepler had detected by the end. These are all planets around other stars. How cool is that? Look at them all. 
It's really, really interesting. And we can see there's other techniques that can detect some planets farther away, but by and far, Kepler has done the most to tell us about planets that are rocky, that have radii similar to that of the Earth. In fact, it's detected lots of planets that have radii smaller than the Earth. So that's very, very exciting. So we're really, for the first time, discovering planets that are Earth-sized and smaller. So what I'm gonna do now is kind of fun. I'm gonna take all of these worlds, all of these yellow dots, and I'm gonna put them all into one solar system, all going around one star. That's, of course, not really how it works, but it gives you an idea of the diversity of all the different planets that we've seen. Okay. So it looks kind of chaotic, but what you're seeing is all 3,000 of these new worlds going around the same star. And if you look carefully with your eye, you'll notice how many of these are really small planets. These are planets that are just one Earth radius in size. And you'll see hot planets that are red. You'll see cool planets that are blue. And it's really fascinating to see them all together. And some are going fast around the star because they're around massive stars in reality. And some are going slow because they're around little cool stars. And then as we start to pan away, you start to realize that there's an awful lot of these planets, and they're all quite close to their, to their parent stars. And we pan around here, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you uh, the orbit of uh, Mercury and Venus and the Earth. And that's going to give you sort of a feeling of the size of these worlds. And what you immediately say, wow, gee, there's a lot of planets inside the orbit of Mercury. Well, most of these planets that we've discovered are really, really close to their stars. That's sort of surprising. And let me explain that, because I think this is important and worth talking about. The reason why we have so many of these planets so close to the star is because of the technique that we use to detect them, this transit technique. Um, if a planet is near its star, the probability of us being able to see it move across the face of its star is fairly high. If the planet's really, really far away, then the alignment has to be just right for us to see it. So there's a probability that decreases our ability to actually detect these as we go farther and farther away. But it means that we can, it's an easy uh, factor to correct for, and we can correct the Kepler data set exquisitely well for this factor. In fact, it turns out that there are lots of planets out here as well, as we'll see later on in the lecture. Okay, so one of the things that I think all of you could appreciate with your eyes is that little planets are common. Before we had Kepler, we didn't have a clue. We actually thought perhaps that big planets were really common because most of the time that's what we detected from the ground because frankly they were the easiest to find, so that's what we found. But as soon as Kepler went out there and made a nice uniform sample, what we were able to find is that little planets were common too. And in particular, these interesting objects called super-Earths turned out to be really pretty common. As well, rocky planets became also very common in the Kepler data set, and that's very exciting because, well, we know one thing about life, that life, at least here on Earth, likes to be on a rocky planet like the Earth. And we know that life likes liquid water. And so if we want rocky planets with liquid water, first we have to start off with these Earth-sized worlds. Super-Earths we don't know so much about. In fact, here you see I've drawn just a white blob because I really don't know what to call it. In our own solar system, we have no such super-Earth. Yet they're fairly common, but they don't belong in our own solar system. So now, what I want to talk about are these rocky planets. Rocky planets are important for life, but not all rocky planets are created equal. Some are really, really hot, almost to the point of melting rock, and some are really, really cold, just frozen ice worlds. What we really want, of course, is a planet that's not too hot and not too cold, sometimes called the Goldilocks sort of planet, uh, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and the real, the real moniker of a really good Goldilocks planet is it's just right to have liquid surface water, okay? That means you've got just enough heat from your star that you can keep water out of its ice phase, but not so much heat that you keep it all the way uh, boiling away into steam, all right? And obviously the Earth is in that zone right now, and so that's sort of where we at least know terrestrial life can survive well. And so this kind of will guide our vision to looking for life around other planets. 
So if we look at the Hab zone, of all the known systems to date, we see that there's a great number of planets that have been detected in this zone, and I've just highlighted a few of them. But for the most part, their sizes tend to be a little big. I mean, you can see here I've got the Earth for scale, and these are all scaled to the Earth's radius, except one in particular kind of jumps out at you. I don't know if you can see it. I'm going to help you here a little bit. I think there we go. Kepler-186f. Kepler-186f is really an exciting world, because if you look at it, it's just the same size as the Earth, and it's also in the special habitable zone. In other words, it gets enough heat from its star that it would have surface liquid water on it. And its star is different from our star. Our star is, I'm going to call it a sun-like star throughout the lecture. It's going around a much, much smaller star, a red star, a little star that we call, because we're astronomers and we can't come up with really good names, so we call them M stars, all right? So M stars, OK? And we're going to talk a little bit about these M stars tonight. So Kepler-186 is a great example of a possibly habitable world, which doesn't mean that there's life on it, but it's possible that there is liquid water on it. And it's around this little star in the habitable zone in its own solar system. It happens to have about a 130-day orbit. So what we want to do is we want to compare these two solar systems, all right? Look at the two different planets. Now, that's actually a pretty good rendering of the Earth. We don't have any idea what Kepler-186f looks like. This is an artist's interpretation, of course, like all images you've ever seen of an exoplanet. Um, and we don't know that it's brown, but we would be interested to know what color it actually is, because that would tell us something about whether there really is the possibility of liquid water on that world. But it's a much smaller system than our system. To be able to image it, to be able to take pictures and understand its colors, we'd have to uh, make a very, 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 very fine angle. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this in my talk. If we were on the Earth and we're looking back to this other solar system, and remember, it's a cool star, so uh, planet F has to be quite close to the star. This is an M star, not so much light, so we, it's got to be very close in. This angle is just a tenth of an arc second which is a very small angle. And that's only if we move this star to 12 light years from the Earth, which is about as close as uh, other M stars are. And so that's a small angle. What is a tenth of an arc second? Well, a tenth of an arc second is, as I say, very small. I mean, one way to just cut to the chase, it's sort of on the order of the width of a dime, the angle subtended by a dime, if you were 22 miles away from the dime, all right? If you think about that, that's like crazy. Oh my god, I mean, how can you possibly image something that small? These are tiny little angles. You know, because astronomers measure things in small angles all the time. One degree has 60 minutes of arc, and each minute of arc is 60 seconds of arc, and now we're talking about a tenth of that. So I'll use this sort of nomenclature throughout this talk, but this is sort of the, the angular scale at which you need to separate the light from the star and the light from the planet. And that's a very important sort of parameter for what I'm going to be talking about later on. The other thing that we have to worry about is our brightnesses. Um, M stars aren't that bright, as I've already mentioned. And so Kepler-186f is something on the order of about 100 million times fainter. That sounds really, really faint. But it's not as bad as the Earth around the sun. The Earth, as viewed from afar, is 10 billion times fainter than our sun. And that's incredibly uh, faint. That's 100 times trickier. So we could ask, is it possible, maybe, to image these worlds around uh, these M stars? Is that a possibility? Can we use our largest ground-based telescopes? And after all, of course, that's what we do at the University of Arizona. We build the world's biggest ground-based telescopes. Can we use some of our telescopes and take pictures of these worlds around these M stars? So we're going to see that. All right, so here is a good example. Uh, I can prove to you that these sort of systems actually exist. For example, there's a star called Captain Star. And around Captain Star, we know there's actually two planets. One of them is in the Hab zone, Captain B. As I said, astronomers never come up with really good names. Anyway, so Captain B, it's right there. And it's in the Hab zone of this M star. And it might have liquid water on it. And what's really amazing about this star is it's really very close. It's just 12.7 light years away. So this is, this is a very exciting discovery. And it would be really interesting to be able to see that. And we can actually, we know the angle exactly to this planet. And it's about half of what I was talking about before. It's 0.05 arc seconds. So the real question is, can, can we possibly be able to work at these sort of angles? And this is something that's motivated a lot of my research. 
But first of all, before we go out and build these super telescopes that can make the sharpest images ever by mankind, we have to know if there's other captain uh, bees out there. And, and so what we really want to know is how common are Earth radii stars at the sort of distance the Earth is from you know, our own sun. And when you look at the Kepler data set, something might sort of jump out at you. You might be, well, Kepler worked really well, uh, but you know, Earth kind of looks lonely over here. There's no little yellow dots around the Earth. And there's the Earth you know, with a period of about 365 days, which of course, as you know, is a year here. And it turns out that the Kepler mission, as wonderful as it was, there, the reaction wheels failed on the spacecraft, and it actually ended its mission two years early, and it wasn't able to really detect too many Earths around sun-like stars. It was a little bit too ambitious, but it detected lots of Earths around smaller stars. And so what we can do is we can extrapolate the data set. And by extrapolating it, we should be able to get to the next level here. All right, there we go. Now, oops, sorry. Um, so now, um, now we can see the Kepler data. And what we can do is we can extrapolate along that data. Now, what I've done here is I've removed that geometric effect that makes all the planets look like they're really close to the star. I've taken that out. And I can now ex extrapolate along that line. And using that, I can then comfortably extend the data set to uh, periods that are similar to the Earth, around 365 days. And then what I can do is I can simply just look at the line along there, and I can see the, the habitable zone, and I can define it kind of narrowly, just sort of saying that, well, the only worlds that could have liquid water have periods very similar to that of the Earth. And then I say, well, and then I integrate that off the y-axis, and I come up with the solution that about 6% of nearby stars have Earth-like planets in the habitable zone. And that's a really interesting number. I could take a slightly more generous viewpoint of where the habitable zone could be in other solar systems, and I come up with a number closer to 22%. Uh, so somewhere in here is probably the truth, somewhere between 6 and 22%. But I really want people to understand where these numbers are coming from. So what I'm doing here, I'm taking the Kepler data set, I'm extrapolating it to periodicity similar to that of the Earth going around our own star, and you know, picking a reasonable zone for where it's too hot to where it's too cold, the Goldilocks zone. And I'm coming up with numbers that between 6% and 22% of all stars in the night sky that you can see, because they're all part of our galaxy, have a one to two, two Earth radii planets, so a rocky world that could have liquid water on its surface that are in the HAB zone. And that's a very, very exciting fact. If you learn nothing else from this talk, please take that away. Take out away this amazing ratio of about one in five stars has an Earth-like world, a rocky planet which possibly has liquid water on it. That's a remarkable statistic. And we really didn't know that. Uh, 20 years ago, remember, we didn't know if there were any other planets around any other stars. And now we know the frequency, roughly, of how common Earth-like stars are with liquid water. So that's an amazing step forward that we've taken as, a, as humankind. I mean, it's really a remarkable fact. It's an amazing thing that I can say that with some confidence to an audience. So that's very exciting. Um, but what about life? So we know that life probably has got to be pretty common. After all, one in five stars, if you take that ratio and you apply it to the 100 billion stars we have in our own galaxy, one walks away with the fact that there must be 20 billion, give or take, Earth-like worlds which have liquid water on them in our own galaxy alone. And I'm not even touching the fact that there's about 100 billion other galaxies in our universe. Altogether, there must be a tremendous amount of liquid surface water on planets. And here on Earth, we know that if we find liquid water, we tend to find life, at least microbial life. So if that's the case, then we can get very excited about the possibility of life in our own Milky Way galaxy, let alone all the other galaxies. So this is very exciting. The other fact, of course, is that you know, life arose here very quickly, as Dean Joaquin was mentioning at the beginning. As far as we can tell, within one to about 200 million years after the end of the late heavy bombardment, some 3.8 billion years ago, life seemed to have arose on Earth. So why wouldn't it do the same on all these other rocky worlds that have liquid water? It's very exciting to think about. So microbial life, at least, must be very common throughout our galaxy, using that sort of reasoning. But, you know, it's exciting to say that, and I find that a very compelling, convincing argument. But what we'd really like is life. We'd really want to have real scientific evidence of life. 
All right, so how do we find life? Well, to find life, we've got to look at the atmospheres of these worlds, and we've got to look for what I'm going to call pollution from life. For example, uh, we know that oxygen can be produced by blue-green algae uh, through photosynthesis. And methanogenic bacteria produces lots of methane, as we know cows can take advantage of. And so we have a situation where a living world produces both oxygen and methane gases. And if we can see those gases at the same time from the atmosphere of an alien world, that tells us and that makes us feel really, really excited about the fact that there could be life on that world. You're seeing disequilibrium in the chemistry of that world, and that can be driven, at least on Earth anyways, it's driven by life. And that's what we believe is a strong biosignature. So that's kind of a neat word. So that's the biosignature that we're looking for, uh, evidence of oxygen and methane at the same time in another world. And how do we find these? Well, it turns out that if you have a gas and you run light through it, and this is something astronomers are really good at, making a rainbow of light, what you'll notice is that certain gases absorb very strongly at certain very specific frequencies of light. And so you see these dark lines in this rainbow. And that can tell me about what different gases are present in the atmosphere of that world. And so that's basically how we can hunt out biosignatures. For example, if I had two worlds, one an Earth-like world and one, say, a Jupiter-like world, and I look at the reflected light off those worlds coming from their star, they have the same star, Light, starlight hits the world, bounces into my telescope. What I'll notice is that they have different absorption lines. They'll have different places where I can see no light. That's because they have different gases in their atmosphere. The Earth-like world has all these wonderful biosignatures. It's got carbon dioxide, methane, water, and oxygen. Whereas the Jupiter-like world, eh, not so much. Mainly just methane, all by itself. And that would not be a world that would look like it was alive. So we want to take these images, and this is basically a more scientific way of presenting that rainbow. You can see these dips here tell me that I've got strong absorptions from these molecules. And in this range of what I'm going to define as visible light through here, we have everything that we could want. And this is basically what, if you took the Earth and you put it by one of these little M stars, this is what you'd be able to see. So this is exactly what we're trying to look for, is this kind of situation where uh, we can see the oxygen and the methane at the same time. And so this is basically life. This is our symbolism for life. And that's very, very exciting. This is what our goal is, is to try to make a spectrum like this of another world. And if we could, we'd be very excited because that would tell us we've probably found life in another world. But there's two big issues here, okay? I'm going to come back to this. I just want to make this clear to everybody. The angles are really, really small. Hab zone planets around these little M stars have to be really up close. You know, think about it if you're, you're making a campfire. You make a little campfire, you've got to be really close to stay warm. If you have a big campfire, of course, you can stay far away. You're the same temperature either way. But with those little M stars, you've got to get really close. As a result, the angles aren't so great. It's like a tenth of an arc second. And here I've got a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, which is our premier space telescope for imaging. And you can see it would be hopeless to be able to see something at a tenth of an arc second. The other thing that's problematic is that the planet itself isn't very bright. It only reflects a very small portion of the starlight back to us. So we have this problem that they're really, really close to the star, but unfortunately, they're really, really faint. And I show this picture because this is something that actually is kind of close to the brightness of what the planet would be. So my task, and it's impossible with the Hubble Space Telescope, is to image something this bright, this close to the star. That's not going to be easy. We're going to have to invent some pretty good technology to be able to do that. And what we probably want to do is use a great big telescope that makes small little images at the diffraction limit. And the biggest telescopes are on the ground. And that's what we do. We build these big telescopes for ground-based observatories here at the University of Arizona. But the problem is, if you're on the ground and you look up at the night sky, everything's blurry because the atmosphere blurs things. It makes stars twinkle. And in this particular case, it makes Venus look really bad. This is a particularly bad example, but you get the idea. Some people say, you know, doing astronomy from the ground is like bird watching from the bottom of a pool. You know, it's <laughs> very difficult. I don't recommend it. All right. so. Astronomers are always coming up with clever ideas to try to fix problems with their big telescopes. And so this atmospheric blurring is no different. So what we use here is a new type of technology called adaptive optics, which I call AO. And uh, adaptive optics is this amazing technology that allows us to remove all that blurring. We use really super fast computers 
to measure how distorted a star looks like, a bright star. So we look at a bright star, we know it's a star, and we make sure that we can fix the way that the aberration of the star is with a mirror that's very special, a rubber mirror. So we calculate what the wavefront aberrations are, and you can see these things look kind of like potato chips. And then we feed back to this rubber mirror. See that mirror? It's rubber now, and it's moving in just such a way that it makes the wavefronts look perfectly flat as it goes back to the science camera. And that allows us to, boom, make images that are diffraction limited. It's really kind of like the way that I like to think about it. It's like by clicking your mouse, you take your ground-based telescope and make it like it's in outer space. So it's making images as good as a telescope would in outer space without the additional cost of launching it and everything, which is actually very substantive. So here's an example of a giant telescope on the ground. This is the 6.5 meter Magellan Telescope in the high Atacama Desert of Chile. This is one of the best places in the whole world for doing astronomy. And you can see how big it is. There's, a, uh, there's an astronomer's head for scale. It's six and a half meters across. And it's very, very large, of course, built here at the University of Arizona's Mirror Lab. And what we do is we put that rubber mirror up at the top of the telescope. That's a really good place for correcting the images. And this is the sort of work that I've been trying to do. And uh, what you can see here is I'm building the, what I call the Magellan AO system. I, I actually call it MAG-AO. Uh, some of you may remember back in the 70s, the really cool wheels were mag wheels, and because they were made out of magnesium. And actually, a lot of what we built here is out of an aluminum magnesium alloy, so it could be light and strong, and so it's called mag AO. Works both ways, anyways. I, I kind of think it's fun. Uh, and so, what we have here is a, a very thin shell. And this shell can actually wiggle back and forth a thousand times a second. So it's like a mirror that, it's that rubber mirror that can move back and forth a thousand times a second, and it can just remove all the aberrations that are being put down by the atmosphere. And this is a unique system in the world in the sense that this is the only one that works in those visible wavelengths right now. So this is quite an exciting thing to undertake, because in theory, we can make better images than anybody else. And it was a project that I started with graduate student Derek Copon and Jared Males. And here we are at the clean room. These are all our actuators, and they feed in to push on 585 different magnets that we had glued on the back of the shell. So from this point of view, it just looks like a normal mirror. But when I click my mouse, it does an amazing dance to remove the turbulence. And so there we are. We're mounted on the telescope. There's a picture of Jared. This is the first time we plugged it in at the telescope. It actually worked. Jared was thrilled, thinking, yes, my PhD is in sight. <laughs> And indeed, I was really excited, too. Uh, it was very exciting. And we got the system up and running. And we went sort of from a design in 2008 to an actual working system in 2012. And this was very, very exciting. And one of the things that's really neat about it is this is MEGAO working, dri driven by instrument scientist Katie Marzinski. And you can see that with, a, with MEGAO turned on, our star is a nice little diffraction-limited image. But if, as soon as we turn it off, that's what it looks like. That's what normal seeing looks like to a large telescope without adaptive optics. You can't find a planet there. The starlight's going all over the place. It's hopeless. But as we turn up the gains on the AO system, you can see very nicely we're pulling in the light very nicely here. And this square box is very, very small. If we can get all the light from the star in that box, then in this box here, this is where we might be expecting a planet to be, we have a shot, at least, of being able to make these angles. That angle there is just 20 milli arc seconds across. 20 milli arc seconds. That's an amazingly sharp image. In fact, those are the sharpest images ever made from the ground or from space ever by mankind of the heavens. So that's pretty cool. And uh, this is an example with... <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, like all things, it was really the grad students that did all the work, so, you know. and. Uh, so this is like what it looks like when you just have it off. That's a normal sort of telescope. We turn it on and zoom. You can see that what we're actually looking at there is a little binary star. And it's pretty exciting. And so this gets us excited about imaging planets around other stars. And it made a little bit of news. And it was very exciting. We could do images better than what you could do from space. And that was neat because our system was much less expensive and worked really well for us. And so one of the things we can do, which is so cool, is that, and, and I promised myself I would do this, is that we, these 20 milli arc second images we can make is kind of neat. And I'm just going to do this very simple little demo here. So what I'm holding in my hand is, in fact, several dimes. <laughs> and what MEGAO can do uh, is tell the difference between 
what I'm showing up here and one dime, if I was standing in Phoenix and Meg AO was in Tucson looking back at Phoenix, that's what 20 milliarc seconds is. And I don't know about you, but my eyesight's not so great anymore. And I don't think I could see whether I'm holding up two dimes or one dime from even, you know, halfway through the audience here. So that tells you something about what 20 milliarc seconds is. It's just an incredibly small angle. And, you know, we're really proud that we're able to, you know, work at those sort of resolutions. And, you know, this is sort of like, okay, let's take a look at something. So this is something that HST looked at. It's a ring of dust around a star. And this is what it looks like with the MEGAO system. And so it's exciting that we're able to make these images this sharp. And we can look at some planets that we already know exist. For example, Jared Mayles did this at the end part of his thesis. He was able to make a beautiful image of the planet Beta Pictoris B for the first time in the visible. And that's very cool, at the very red end of the visible. But it was still a nice feat. But this is a large Jupiter-like planet. What we really want to know is, what about looking for Earth-sized planets? What about life? What about liquid water? So the reality check is, is that can we do what our real goal is to image these things, but at the same time maintain that incredible contrast level of 10 to the 8? So we're going to do a little example here where we, we kind of tested our system to see if we could see planets around this particular star, HD 142527. And we use a whole bunch of optical tricks, which allow us to go from that great big bright star, and we sort of difference the image. We take the fact of the rotation of the planets on the sky and whatnot. And what we're able to convince ourselves is that um, we're able to get down to this sort of uh, level where I don't know if you can see these faint little planets here. Here, I'll just highlight them here in a second. And you'll see this faint little row of planets. These are actually what we uh, can uh, extract out of that data. And it uh, tells us that we can detect very faint planets with MEGAO, but not maybe as faint as we'd like, and not quite as close in as we'd like. So for example, we have made discoveries of objects that are at a tenth of an arc second. And at a tenth of an arc second, let's see here, come on, let's go. All right, there we go. Uh, and you can see here, uh, we were able to locate that object. And that's great, but what we really need to find Earth-like planets, and this is the reality check part, is we really need to have contrasts that are 10,000 times more than what we can achieve. MEGAO is great. I'm very excited about it, very keen on it. But it's not quite powerful enough to image habitable worlds around other stars. We're not quite there yet. So I want you to take that away, too, from the talk, is that although we're able to image amazing things with MEGAO and detect bright things at a tenth of an arc second, we can't detect super faint things like the weak light reflected off a habitable world. So what do you need to do? You need to add some more special optics. You need to use chronographic optics that have been developed by Professor Olivier Guillon here at the University of Arizona. These are amazing mirrors that block the light of the star but let the light of the planet pass through. And that allows us to make very, very high contrast images. And in that case, so one way of sort of visualizing how this would all work, I have this very simple movie here, and I just want to show it. So you get an idea about how we could let the light of the planet through but block the light of the star. And this is certainly how we're going to eventually image planets around other stars in reflected light. So we need to block that starlight. And this is our cartoon of how the light, say, coming from MEGAO could be further modified by use of this, this telescopic piece of optics called a chronograph. So the first thing is, you see, is that the light from the star makes this diffraction pattern. And it's very bright. So we can block it with an opaque mask that we put right in the very center of the focal plane. And that gets rid of most of the light from the star. But to really clean it up, we also want to just cut down the pupil just a little bit there. So we, we remove the light in two places. And that makes the star very, very dark. The planet, of course, is a tenth of an arc second off axis, which means it misses the dark part of the mask, and the planet light is able to go through. That's the basic working principle of how a chronograph can allow you to image planets around other stars, and that's really exciting. The only problem is there's still some aberrations in the wavefront. MEGAO is great, but it's not perfect. Like any optical system, there's still some aberrations. So we use another deformable mirror, another one of these rubber mirrors, to clean up the image even further. And when that mirror dials in the exact opposite of the aberration that's in the beam, what you get is this gradual dark halo occurring. And that really allows you to block the starlight. And you can see the Jupiter-like planet and the Earth-like planet that we've embedded in this simulation. 
And then all we have to do is, of course, the easy trick of just breaking that light out into rainbows, and then we just have to start looking for the biosignatures and to see whether these worlds that we're seeing in our chronograph, whether they have these biosignatures of things like water and carbon dioxide and methane. So that's, that's the whole idea. Now, of course, if you really want to look for life, you need a bigger telescope. MEGAO is great, but six and a half meters is not going to quite cut it. And we build the world's biggest mirrors here, so we should be talking about what we're doing with our next generation telescope. Our next generation telescope is a true monster, a 24 meter telescope. This is just one of seven segments that we made in the Richard Karras Mirror Lab. And this is a very exciting project. This is where the University of Arizona is going in terms of astronomy. And it's very exciting because it's a four times bigger telescope, so we can image four times closer in. And that means instead of looking for life maybe around one or two stars, and we'd struggle to do that, this would allow a survey of, say, 55 nearby stars. Looking for life, you know, we have this one to five rule, so that means that we should have about 11 worlds that might have life on them. How great would that be? 11 worlds with the possibility of detecting life. Granted, probably microbial life, but it's still very, very exciting. And so the 2020s will be very exciting. The Giant Magellan Telescope is just a, an amazing idea. You can't build a single 24-meter mirror, but what we've come up with here is to break it up into seven different segments, each one designed so that when it's all placed together, it makes one giant, powerful telescope. And here you can see a beautiful animation of how it works. But it's on the ground, so it also needs adaptive optics. So just like MEGAO uses the little mirror at the top, the little mirrors for the GMT will also be adaptive. This isn't quite how we're going to drop the mirrors in, but you, you sort of get the idea. That's if we were in a real rush. <laughs> and here you can see an image of the secondary mirror here. So these will be the adaptive units. So up there, those will be those uh, mirrors. They'll be floating on that magnetic field, moving 1,000 times a second to give us perfect images, just like the GMT was in outer space. And that's going to be really exciting. And if we don't have a bright star to know how to correct the atmosphere, we'll just make our own star. So we'll use big, powerful lasers and make our own stars. It's actually pretty cool. <laughs> and so that's, that's the giant Magellan Telescope. And that's, that is really going to be the future for Arizona astronomy. And uh, of course, NASA is not staying still either. They're going to launch in 2018 the JWST telescope. Uh, one of our professors here is the PI of one of the main cameras for this. And this stands a chance of looking for biosignatures around perhaps one or two planets if they're discovered in time by the test mission. It's not really a life finder mission, but it's interesting. Uh, another very high contrast uh, uh, mission is called the W-First mission, and it will fly a chronograph. And just like the movie I showed you, in fact, it was developed by Nick Siegler, actually an ex-graduate student of mine who works for JPL, and this is what JPL is really excited about. With no mask, you can't really see the planet, but with that chronographic mask, we should be able to see planets with this. But they're probably not planets around M stars because it can't quite get into that tenth of an arc second resolution. It's only 2.4 meters. It's not quite big enough. Uh, and it's not quite high enough contrast to find um, Earths around sun-like stars. So that's the subtlety here. To really find Earths around suns, okay, to find a true Earth around a star just like our sun is really hard because, in fact, the contrast is 10 billion times between the Earth and the sun. That's a tremendous amount of contrast. How are we going to do that? Well, to do that properly, we need a very large telescope in outer space. So we need a future large telescope to do that. Sure, the Giant Magellan Telescope can help us with planets around M stars, but I think for finding Earths around suns, we need giant telescopes of the future, large 8 to 16 meter telescopes. And NASA has been really working hard on the technology development for this. And in fact, one of the highlight technologies for the future mission is, again, the University of Arizona's PIA chronograph that I mentioned from Olivier Guillon. And that's very exciting, so we're working with NASA on this. And this sort of mission, this sort of 16 meter in space, could look at 200 stars and make beautiful biosignature plots like this, really teasing out the signatures of life around other stars. So what I'd like to conclude with is just a summary of what we talked about. So one, what you've got to take away from this talk is yes, there are Earth-sized worlds in the habitable zone of other stars. Okay, that's very important. And two, another takeaway from this lecture is roughly one in five stars in the night sky 
So next time you walk outside, maybe not tonight because it's so cloudy, but you know, in Tucson we see lots of stars. You look up there, and if you can count five stars, odds are one of those stars has an Earth-radius planet with the possibility of liquid water on it. And that's an amazing thing to know. And you know, there could be easily 20 billion such worlds in our own galaxy. That's a tremendous fact. And the other thing that I'd like to leave you with is that in the next 25 years, the University of Arizona and our partners, of course, and NASA will be working hard to develop the next generation of ground-based and space-based telescopes to actually tease out these biosignatures from the world so we know for sure whether or not we're alone in the universe, which is a nice segue into next week's talk given by Professor Chris Imphy, which is going to be a very good talk. Uh, and we're going to talk more about not just microbial life, but Chris will be talking to you about intelligent life. And so that's going to be very exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you.